Welcome to Front Royal Presbyterian's virtual online service. We're glad that you've tuned in today. We hope that you find this to be a worship service filled with God's peace and the ability to glorify God in all places everywhere. I do have a few announcements that I just want to make sure that you're aware of. First, thank you for your generosity, compassion, caring, understanding, gifts, food, driving. Over the past four weeks, um, Obviously, I'm still unable to put weight on my right leg, and I have four more weeks, so it's a long journey, but I appreciate your help um, and your understanding. Um, I have exciting news. Next Sunday, September 12th, we will have a special surprise following worship outside in the parking lot. We will have ice cream fellowship. CNC um, Treats is coming with their truck, and we have contracted with them to serve everybody ice cream. So if you're not able to come to worship because you're unsure about in the sanctuary, you can still join us outside for ice cream afterwards. We would love to see you. Um, we are um, going to begin this year Backpack Buddies. The need has increased from previously I think we were doing 60 students, then we did 70, and they've now got 90. So we're trying to um, be creative to find ways to serve those students in E. Wilson Morrison. Um, we will need help packing, so please pay attention to that. It's an easy way that you can give back and feed the kids. So I hope that you'll um, take some time to help us with that Backpack Buddies program. We also are collecting items for the Afghan refugees. We're working with the Islamic Center in Fairfax to give them nece basic necessities that they might need as they come over here fleeing their own homes. So you can check the newsletter for that. And finally, we are sending care packages to our students, our kids, and our shut-ins. So I hope that if you have a, an extra minute to bake some cookies um, or come and help us deliver these the week of September 13th. I'd love to have your help. So, lots going on. I know there's a lot going on in the world. So let's take this time to let the peace of Christ reign in our hearts. Let us worship the Lord God together. Good morning. Peace in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Peace be with you. In this time of worship, Lord, we seek your peace in the midst of a world full of hurricanes, earthquakes, disease, war, famine, and emptiness of heart. So that in this time, our prayers, our words, and actions may not be to our own glory, but to yours alone. Psalm 46 speaks, saying, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its water roar and foam, though the mountains tremble in its tumult, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Join me in the prayer of confession. Merciful Lord, we say we want peace, yet our hearts and minds cling to anger, prejudice, 
revenge, and hatred. We claim as individuals, as a community, and as a nation to work for peace, yet our greed, power, and arrogance stand in our way. Lord, have mercy. For the peace we seek is not the peace of Christ, but a peace that is self-serving and centered around our own selves. Forgive our ignorance. Confront us with our failings. Teach us your peace of mercy, compassion, and love. Lord, hear our prayer. to condemn only Christ and it is Christ that died for us Christ that rose for us Christ that reigns for us and it is Christ alone who forgives us as we return once again to these life-giving waters we remember that we are forgiven and so we are told to go and forgive others you are forgiven be at peace for my knee. See, look at that. No fun at all. Scars and everything. But the doctors were good and I have had lots of special care from you guys and food and all sorts of goodies. So thank you for that. I am back and I have a children's story to share with you. I bet you each have a sibling, which is a brother or a sister. I have an older sister and a younger brother, Kathleen and John. And we get along now, but when we were little, we did not get along. We used to fight. My mother used to get us, we'd get in trouble. She'd send us to the garden to pick up the weeds. That was our punishment. I have Jacob and Isabel, and lots of you guys know him. Jacob's older, so you don't see much of him. He's 22, and Isabel is 17, but lots of you know Izzy, because she helps with the nursery. Now, they weren't always 22 and 17 years old. They were young. And one day we were driving to church and they were fighting about who was going to sit behind my seat because they both had to sit in the back seat because it was safer. They were fighting over who was going to sit behind my seat. They fought and fought and fought and fought and fought. And then I was just so frustrated with them that I said, fine, you know what? You're both sitting in the back seat, Isabel here, Jacob here. And in the middle, I want you to hold hands all the way to church. Now look at this picture, because it's hilarious. You see Jacob's face? He's smiling. And Isabel's got this look of disgust on her face. And she has one finger, one little finger. And Jacob's like, here's my hand and one little finger. And I'll tell you the story, because think of Jacob and Isabel in that picture. When we return something, when if somebody hurts you, pushes you down, gets into a fight with you, what's your first thing you want to do? If you get pushed down, you want to push them down, right? Yeah, pretty much. If somebody hits you, you want to hit them back. If they take your toy, you want to steal it back. That's what that's what we are. And that's what Jacob and Isabel were doing. And I told them to hold hands and well, Isabel didn't want to do that. 
the real thing about peace, you know what peace is? The peace of Christ, that one thing that makes us feel comfortable and safe and protected, is it's not the enemy that causes the peace. It's not the person who pushed you down. It's how you respond. So look back at that picture of Jacob and Isabel. Which one of those, Jacob or Isabel, is at peace? <gasps> Certainly not Isabel. Jacob gives his whole hand to her and she just gives a little finger. So what are you going to do when something goes wrong and you have to be the peacemaker? You're going to give them your whole hand and, and offer forgiveness? Or are you going to just give a little bit, just the tiniest bit, just to meet the standards? See, sadly, in our world, we, we do just a tiny bit but it's important that we give of our heart because that's what Jesus gave for us. I love you guys and I miss you and I will see you soon. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your mercy, your trust, your grace, and most of all for your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are a people of faith, and in that faith, we join together as brothers and sisters in Christ to work towards justice, peace, and unity. To that end, Front Royal Presbyterian actually actively works within the community to feed the hungry, house the homeless, care for the sick, and heal the brokenhearted. You are invited to join us in mission by your talents, your gifts, your service, and your prayers. Let us pray. We are blessed with the bounty around us. We are blessed with the generous hearts of this congregation, their gifts that go to build community and to help those around the world. So God, we give these to you, asking you once again to bless them. Use them in the service of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our scripture today comes from 1 Peter 3, 8 through 11. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it.
our liturgical calendar, the season of peace. And so I chose a passage that is very familiar. It's from John chapter 14, and it's Jesus preparing his disciples for when he's going to be leaving and telling them what is after this world. I'm going to pick up in the Gospel of John chapter 14 with verse 25. I have said these things to you while I'm still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. So do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I'm going away and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I'm going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs so that when it does occur, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no power over me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us be on our way. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. Good and gracious God, your word speaks to us throughout the generations. Though it is ancient, it is eternal in its truth. So open up your scriptures to us today and every day so that we might hear your word and know your peace. Amen. They say, and we were taught in seminary, that when you preach a sermon, you should have the newspaper in one hand and the Bible in another, or your favorite news app in one hand and the Bible in the other. And I find this really, really challenging these days. In Afghanistan right now, over the past few weeks, the world has changed. Women and girls are now forced to stay home if they can't go on the street without a male escort. Their lives are in a different place and no doubt they are terrified. They've been released from their jobs, sent home, and the Taliban makes all of these promises, but we don't believe them because we knew what was happening 20 years ago. And now they've been thrown back in time to 20 to 30 years before, after all the progress. And when I read this in the news, I can then turn to scripture. And Psalm 46 is one of my favorites. Just as we think about the people of Afghanistan, scripture reads, he makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. It doesn't really match up, does it? Psalm 46, it just doesn't work. Haiti has had another earthquake, barely being able to come back from the earthquake in 2010. The mountains shook, the, everything was upside down for them. And Psalm 46 became very real to me in 2010 when we were there during the first earthquake. Psalm 46 reads, Therefore we will not fear that the earth should change, the mountains will shake in the heart of the sea. We will not fear. It doesn't match up. It just doesn't work. Hurricane Ida has come through its hurricane season and it's left a path of destruction down south. And I woke up today on Thursday morning and the news was that New York City's subway is all but shut down. That they've had more deaths in New York because of flash flooding. Airports are closed. It just doesn't seem right. And a few weeks ago in Ethiopia, the seminary in Metu, in Addis, excuse me, in Addis, a flash flood took the lives of seven seminary students. That's what the newspaper tells us. And scripture says, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult, there's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. It doesn't really work because the reality of this world does not match up with what scripture is telling us and here we are finding ourselves again facing a winter where covid numbers are rising elective surgeries are canceled icu beds are overflowing we've got the mask versus anti-mask vaccinated versus anti-vaccinated debate and the very real possibility that our children will once again go back to virtual school, stripping from them their social lives, and for many, food. And scripture says, God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar, the kingdoms totter, he utters his voice, the earth melts, the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. And those are comforting words, without a doubt. 
but it doesn't change the world in which we live. And I can't reconcile this newspaper, this world, with scripture. And we can look at it two ways. We can look to the possibility that as we look around the world, there is no God. Because what kind of God would inflict this much pain on his beloved children? There is no God, is one way. The other way is to say that, yes, there is a God. His plan is more perfect than I can imagine. I can sit nicely in church, fold my hands, and feel this safe place, the advocate welcoming me, and live in a world of scripture divorced from reality. Isolate myself. There has to be a middle ground. There has to be some way to take the scripture and make sense of this and the newspaper and know that God is in the midst of it. And today is the beginning of the season of peace. And we need it now more than ever. However, pews are emptier than they were before. People are not returning to church or their previous nonprofit volunteer lives. People isolate themselves. They stick with just their COVID circles to be safe. War continues. Refugees are flooding into our country and around the world. Our world is politically divided. We can't even find peace within our own walls at home, much less in this world. And the result is pastors have been told and Zoom classes, it's compassion fatigue. We're tired and we don't have anything left. We don't have enough compassion, energy, love, peace to fill the void in the world. Now here's your Presbyterian lesson for the day. World Communion Sunday is celebrated on the first Sunday in October, however, in a small church called Shadyside Presbyterian in the 1930s, the PC, um, a PC USA, it was then not the PC USA, but the Presbyterian Church began World Communion Sunday. And the reasoning was this. It was during the Second World War that the spirit caught hold because we were trying to hold the world together World communion symbolized the effort to hold things together in a spiritual sense. It emphasized that we are one in the spirit and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's Dr. Hugh Thompson Kerr, the pastor of Shadyside Presbyterian. And some 91 years later today, we find ourselves trying to still hold the world together. While we're not in the midst of a world war, there's still a similar sort of hatred and greed and power and despair. And we're tired of trying to hold the world together. I don't know about you. It's compassion fatigue. I'm exhausted. What is peace in this world in which we live? One of my favorite authors is Barbara Brown Taylor, and she tells this story. She went to her nephew's first birthday party, little Will, and as they were cutting cake and all the family is around, Will starts to show off and shows his dance, and apparently it's a very elaborate dance where he flails his arms and dances around in circles, and little Will is so excited. All he's ever known in his life is love, and all of a sudden, Jason, the older brother, gets jealous that Will is getting all the attention and he walks through and just as Will is dancing he pushes him to the floor. His little rear end thumps she says his head hit the floor and it went crack and then a howl came from Will's mouth. How do you think he would respond? Of course they comforted little Will but what about Jason? How, how many Parents would have turned and yelled in anger, sent him away to his room. But before any of that could happen, Will stopped crying. He stood up and he walked over to Jason, put his arms around him, and put his head on Jason's chest. 
because Will knew nothing else. <laughs> and she tells that in that moment, all of her Christian convictions went out the window because that is not the response that she would have had. She shares that she would have wanted revenge. She shared that her heart was all of a sudden dark towards Jason. And when Will hugged Jason, the entire feeling in the room changed. Because Will was able to show love in the face of anger. What Will did was take a moment that he didn't understand and responded in love. What Will did to Jason ended the meanness in that room, all of a sudden. And Will was a very embodiment of the love of Christ that we're supposed to show to one another. But what would you do? I, no doubt, would have yelled. But according to our Christian convictions, Will was right and everybody else was wrong. Jesus understood that the real enemy in this world isn't the Jason that pushes you down, but the real enemy is what it is inside of you that makes you want to leap up and push back. The enemy is not out there, it is within each one of us. When everyone has their fists in the air, the enemy wins. And Jesus tells his disciples, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and don't let them be afraid. Could it be that a little boy understands this a little bit more than each and every one of us who attends worship and reads our Bible on a regular basis? That peace of Christ is not of this world. It's something that the world cannot give, but it is a peace that arises deep within you that when you are dancing, when you are joyful and somebody pushes you down, you leap up and hug them back. That when the world is becoming unglued around you, we remember that deep down we are held together by the one who gives us that peace. We remember that we have our oneness with the one who has given me life and very, my very being. I do not give to you as the world gives. There's a newspaper and a Bible. And oddly, we try to think of this peace of Christ and we use it as almost an escape. It's not the peace of a cemetery. It's not the peace of, of singing a quiet hymn. It's not the peace of a sleeping child. It's not even the peace of a world with no war. This peace that Jesus speaks of is speaking new life into an old world. It speaks life, a new life. It's a peace that takes us from a limited identity to a larger identity. It's a peace that tells us that you may not remain isolated. You must consider the people around you. And we have to instill those Christian virtues of justice, compassion, faith, hope, and love. And we no longer live just for ourselves. And I'll be honest, that's not the American way. It's not our way because we live for ourselves. There's an old benediction and it, and it says, may God deny you peace, but grant you glory. May God deny you peace, but grant you glory. Because the peace of Christ is a double-edged sword. Though we have the peace of Christ within us, acknowledging the peace of Christ also makes us realize that there is no peace until everybody has peace. There is a quiet peace of Christ that in that double-edged sword opens our eyes and should and does make us uncomfortable in the world in which we live. There is no peace for us 
until there is peace for all. There is no justice for us until there is justice for all. So though we have the peace of Christ, it makes us uncomfortable. Can we cry peace when there is none? The places in the world, if you go to third world countries, there are places in this world where children have toys that you couldn't imagine. In Haiti, it's very familiar to see a, a, a bicycle tire that's been flattened and children pushing it along with a stick so it rolls. I've seen children pick up condoms discarded in the road and blow them up like balloons and play balloon volleyball. And a pastor tells a story about how he was walking down a refugee camp and he saw a child playing a flute. And when he walked closer to comment to the child how pretty the song was, he noticed that it was not indeed a flute, it was the barrel of a rifle. How do we do that? How do we take the weapons of war and turn them into toys to entertain ourselves? Because that's what scripture tells us. Isaiah chapter 2, they will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will take up sword will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. How do we take the weapons of war that we are so comfortable with and then turn them into a flute or a plowshare? How do we take those weapons of terror and turn them into tools for justice and peace? And as we come upon the September 11th anniversary, 20 years, how do we take those images that shook our very world, that horrified our faces for weeks and years on end, and not fill our hearts with hatred and anger of the past, but instead, like little Will, wrap our arms around one another and lay our head on our enemy's chest? How in the world do we lay down the fist and silence the inner demons, that meanness that is the real enemy within us, and seek peace? Is it even worth it? Would it even make a difference? Stanley Horowitz said, and he's a Methodist minister, and I've said this before, but I love this. He said in the wake of 9-11, he said, in that injustice that brought us to our knees, he actually said, yes, we need to respond. We need to respond, and as our government was responding with bombs and military and occupation of Afghanistan, Horowitz says, God's justice, God's peace is not a peace of this world. As Jesus says, it is, I give to you not as the world gives, and Horowitz said, yes, we must bomb them. Bomb them with bread. Bomb them with bread. Bomb them with compassion. But that's not our way. That's the idealistic way of a toddler. Those are the dreams of Woodstock in years past. And it might be that within these walls we can, we can grasp on to that, that little thought where we're safe in this worship place, but in the real world, in the newspapers, in the politics of life, no, our way is revenge. And we allow that inner meanness to come out. And we throw up our fists and we bomb them. Make them pay. An eye for an eye. No justice until we declare what justice is and we define it. And when that happens, when everyone's fist is in the air, the enemy wins. And now Afghanistan has returned to its former state 20 years later. For what? What did we actually accomplish? What changed when we threw our fist in the air? There certainly isn't any more peace today than there was then. In fact, today there are lives that have been lost. Money spent, I can't even imagine how much money has been spent. Families torn apart. And what do we have to show for it? Why even bother? 
Neither option works. Our humanity will not let us bomb them with bread, but our Christian side, that Christ that reigns or ought to reign in our heart, also can't turn away while there are great injustices occurring. It's the double-edged sword. And what's the answer? And sadly, I really don't know. In the meantime, though, as we work through the mess of this world that we have created, that we have brought upon God's good creation, we live into a larger identity than ourselves. We speak a new life into the old ways of this world. And we speak a new life of Christ in whom we live and have our being. We set aside politics and fear and greed. And that's hard to do. But we set that aside and we offer compassion in the form of welcoming the strangers desperately fleeing Afghanistan, leaving at their homes, many of them leaving their loved ones behind unknowingly what's going to happen. And though their faces might terrify us, we still welcome them. We meet their needs by offering something of ourselves. Look at the newsletter. There's a list of things. We are working with the Islamic Community Center in Fairfax. We set aside judgment. We think larger than ourselves and introduce the possibility that maybe, just maybe, God's plan is bigger than our own and we trust in the God that says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. Because the peace of Christ isn't the superficial peace of this world. It's a whole different story. So my friends, may God deny you peace, but grant you glory. All glory be to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. My friends, this is the table, and we gather here not just in this place or in your homes, but around the world with all of those that declare Christ to be the Son of God and our risen Savior. And so it is Christ that is host and Christ that welcomes us to this table. But before we break bread and drink of this cup, we give thanks in our prayer of thanksgiving. Let us pray. Lord, in the beginning of time, you spoke and an entire world was created. And you made it perfect just for us and you provided for our each and every need. You gave us life, you gave us companionship. And yet still, Lord, we, we chose greed over your love. And when you granted us the peace of the Garden of Eden, we chose to disobey. And from that day forward, Lord, we confess that we have chosen our own way over your way. You, in your graceful love, mercy, and compassion for us, sent all sorts of those prophets and judges and kings to, to bring us back to your way. And Lord, we still denied you. We thought our way was better, so we chose the ways of this world over yours. And in an ultimate act of love, you gave us your only son who walked among us, breathed among us, ate with us. And yet still, Lord, we denied that you were God. And in the ultimate act of justice, your justice, Christ on the cross, an act of justice, a mercy that we did not deserve, but you gave anyway. And in that, Lord, we also see the resurrection. We see the truth of your love for us and how amazing and how it goes beyond anything we can begin to imagine. And we give thanks that you, O oh Lord, have granted to us this bread and this cup to remind us that you gave your life so that we might live. We give you thanks, Lord, for this church and this community, for all of those communities that are working together to bring about peace and justice. 
We ask you, Lord, to open our hearts and set aside that anger within us so that we might reach out with compassion and justice and love and mercy. And we ask you, Lord, to make us uncomfortable so that we have to act, that we can no longer sit still, that we must do something as we welcome the strangers of Afghanistan. We pray, Lord, for their peace. As we begin to do backpack buddies and seek to serve more kids than ever before, Lord, we grant, ask you to bless the food and let it multiply so that all might be fed. As we look to our loved ones that are sick, those that are fighting COVID, our frontline workers that are exhausted, we ask you once again, Lord, to just be with them. We lift up to you, Adrian Burt, with health concerns. We continue to lift up to you, Richard Johansson. Those in the path of Hurricane Ida as it came through the nation this past week, Lord, be with those that have lost lives and property, those that are scared and alone. For all of these things, Lord, we lift up to you because you are a merciful and loving God and you hear our prayers. So let us pray together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. We remember that on the night that he was betrayed, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, after having blessed the bread, he took it and he said, this is my body broken for you, take and eat. And in the same manner, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins, take and drink. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. The gifts of God for the people of God. The body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. Once again, Lord, the world confuses us and we claim to understand things that are beyond our knowledge. So, Lord, speak to us through this sacrament, through the fellowship, through the love of your true grace. Amen. My friends, today there is no better benediction than that old one. So, I hope you're uncomfortable. May God deny you peace and grant you glory. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. Shalom, 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 shalom.